Howdy. How's everybody doing? Um, we're just about to um, do part two of of, of a uh, class that I didn't know there would be a part two to, but uh, we had some technical difficulties yesterday and got booted off. Um, so we're going to um, do the second part. Now, if you uh, didn't take yesterday's class and um, you want to see what we talked about yesterday, because we talked about a lot, um, it'll be archived and um, you'll be able to watch that. This is the second half, and the reason we're even... I mean, I mean, I could have just let it go, but we didn't talk about citrus, which is kind of one of the more important or more popular plants that people want to know about. So I definitely wanted to make sure that we covered that and, uh, and you know, the other things that are in, that, that we were going to cover. So anyway, I uh, hope you have your drink. I have mine. Rest in peace, RBG. Sorry if that pisses anyone off, but... This is, oops. Oh, <laughs> This is what we're drinking tonight. Yeah, tonight we're drinking. We got it from Westbound. Uh, oh. Les Heretiques. I don't know. I'm not I don't a, know how to camera. I don't know French. Um, or I don't know how to pronounce French. I never learned French, which is either. something I always wanted to learn. But anyway, uh, and that's what we're drinking. Cheers. Cheers, RGB. BG. I'm sorry. And we're screwed. <laughs> so let's talk about fruit trees, right? Um, this, so Upcoming classes. You're gonna make do that again? Okay. I mean, just... Yeah, we should. So there are two upcoming classes on Monday and Tuesday, and they're not going to be the same format as what we did, what we've been doing. It's because it's being done through um, um, strategic habitat enhancements, which is Carrie Ann Campbell, and so um, uh, they have a different sign up method. So when you go to our website and go to our online classes, you can sign up for those classes. One's going to be on food, growing, growing food plants. And another one is going to be on uh, uh, top pollinator plants. So those are worth taking, and just go sign up for them. Um, and just you know, they have their they have their own method of, uh, of of doing that. So, and then we'll start up another series at some point too. But we're probably going to take a little, we might take a week or two off and go camping. Not the whole time, I wish. Um, <laughs> that'd be so nice. <laughs> but alas, we can't get away for that long. Um, so, um, yeah, people are filing in, so thanks for joining. Again, if, uh, if you are watching this class and you didn't watch yesterday, um, the stuff we talked about yesterday will be archived and you'll be able to watch that. We're going to continue on the class for the people who've been watching, and that way they don't have to watch the whole class again, because it's a long class. Like yesterday, what we, it was like two hours, two hours. and we still didn't finish. Oh. Anyway, there's more to come. Uh, not two hours, thank goodness, tonight. But uh, we're going to definitely talk about citrus. We're going to talk about capers and some other things that we didn't get to yesterday um, before we got cut off. Basically, we were sharing a power cord, and one of the computers, the one I was using to uh, um, to uh, do the stream, stream um, <laughs> powered down and then we couldn't get back on the same stream so it's not like we could rejoin the same stream and everyone was fine it was it was over so it was a mess, was a mess. anyway let's get to the class so i'm going to do a little forever mirror here thing for a second and then here we are i think this is about where we left off um where we got cut off so we had uh you know previously just talked about walnuts, right? I said, don't buy the English walnut. It doesn't grow here, but we have a native one, the black walnut, which is really good. So anyway, that's where we, that's where we left off, where we got cut off, and we left off on the um, cirrus. So um, this is a plant you've probably seen around town. Um, there's some confusion, even amongst botanists, on the identification of, of uh, these cacti. There's two species. Um, Cirrus repandus is the one with, uh, it's a little bit hardier than Cirrus, what they used to call Cirrus peruvianus, which is Cirrus himanianus. But anyway, they're very similar. They both have edible fruit. They both grow about the same height. I don't even know exactly what the difference is, but there is a, there is a little bit of difference in hardiness. If you can get repandus and you know it's repandus, it's a little hardier to the cold. Um, it is self-pollinating. You don't need another one to uh, to get the fruit. 
um, really easy to grow. It's a cactus. You're fr if you're from here or you've been here a while, you know how to grow these. It's it's uh, not a challenge. They can grow in full sun. Um, they can even grow in some shade. Not deep shade, but like light shade to be fine. They're probably going to fruit better with at least half a day of sun, of direct sun. Um, and uh, oh, and it, you do get more fruit if you have another plant. That is... They are self-pollinating, but they do uh, produce more fruit if if there's another another plant. Um, and the, the, they say the taste is uh, a cross between shaved ice and melon or kiwi. Hmm. Uh, not my description. <laughs> the rind you don't eat. You eat the inside, um, which is kind of this white, fluffy stuff with seeds in it. Um, it's it's uh, really cool that it's uh, moth and bat pollinated. Um, I'm always a big fan of providing nectar for those night pollinators. Um, and uh, yeah, so easy, easy plant to grow um, with uh, minimal water and get some food out of it. Um, this plant's a little more of a challenge to grow here, mainly because of the frost. It doesn't really mind the heat that much, but, um, but uh, it does need to be watered more than typical cactus. So this is dragon fruit. Uh, Hylocerus, there's many species, um, but uh, and the species that I have listed on there are the ones that um, do the best here. So um, um, Undulatus is the one I've grown, um, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's a fast growing plant um, in a shady spot in your yard, you know, not too much, you don't want to put it in full sun. Um, moderate water like good drainage always with cacti always with most plants really honestly like it's it's important to have good drainage um no matter no matter what you're planting and there's very few things don't want good drainage so just pro try to always have good drainage uh this is another bat pollinated plant um, or moth but the bees also are pretty important to its pollination um and uh, yeah, it's uh, it's it's kind of a cool looking plant too. So um, so this would be this is a fun one. Um, capers. So for a long time, it was really difficult to get a hold of a plant because uh, the seed does the seeds uh, viability is not very long. And anytime you have a plant that's not from here and doesn't have good viability on seed, it's hard to get a hold of usually. It, I don't think it takes cuttings either. Um, so uh, for a long time, I remember uh, I, I used to work for Andrew Weil. He, you know, he has he has a bit of money. I used to grow his food for him, basically, and, and take care of all of his plants and, and write for his magazine about gardening and plants and stuff. And he, uh, he really wanted a caper. And even with the money we had at our, you know, to, to spend, we could, I couldn't find one. Um, at that time, this was a while ago, but uh, they're a little more available now, but they're still fairly hard to get a hold of. We, we got them. Um, I have a friend in Phoenix who uh, has ha got a hold of a plant. Um, she's a foodie and she's uh, of Italian descent, so, <laughs> and loves Italian food. And so, um, you know, she, she figured it out and she's been growing them. Basically, you know, if you get a hold of a plant, then you got fresh seed, and you just and and even if you do have fresh seed, it's still difficult to germinate the seed. There's all these tricks, so not the easiest plant in the world to grow. It volunteers, though. Funny enough, um, I've already had a volunteer in my yard since I've got capers growing. Um, capers are cool. They're in uh, there. There's a you know we actually have some native capers down in Sonora, but I don't I don't know that they're edible. But um, but we have some actually one. Uh, one of one of the caper caperids um, that are shrubby get barely makes it up into Arizona in the Oregon Pipe National Monument area, um, but uh, I don't think anyone's tried to eat the flower buds of that. So it, it, maybe I don't know. I would have to check that out. Um, but anyway, this is a it's an evergreen plant if it doesn't get too cold. But it is hardy down to 18 degrees. So, uh, for example, we had two uh, five-gallon plants that, that that I haven't put in the ground yet. One of them I'm going to put in the ground soon, actually. Um, but they uh, they went 
leafless and I was a little nervous, but I did know that they were hardy down to 18 degrees. So I just kept taking care of it the best way I could and they leafed out and they were just fine. They, so they, they may drop their leaves if the temperature gets cold, especially in a container where they're more exposed. Um, but in other parts of town, I get, we're in a little bit of a cold spot because we're at the base of a mountain. So like, um, when you're at the base of uh, a slope, sometimes you get all that cold air. Um, in our yard, we definitely get it. So, uh, so you know, our our plants in the containers definitely lost their leaves. Um, it is self-pollinating, so um, it so you don't need another one. And uh, the entire plant is edible. So everybody knows about capers, or most people do. And and if you don't know what it is, it's the pickled flower bud. So the thing that we eat is capers, those little green things that you find in Italian food. Um, it, it's a it's a flower bud. Before the flower bud opened, before the flower opened up, they picked it and then they pickled it. Um, but the fruits, which look like miniature watermelons almost, um, they are also pickled. And the other thing that I found out when I started growing capers is that the leaves are um, edible and people pickle them. And so I have not yet done that to our plant so um, it is something I want to try though and see how they taste. Um, it, a lot of these things it's just how you pickle them and what kind of spices you use when you're flavoring your pickle but anyway this is a this is a shrub but it's a weird shrub because in in nature in its natural habitat they grow out of like rock crevices and so um, so they don't tend to get very tall they grow about two or three feet tall but they can spread pretty wide, 10 or 12 feet wide. So a really wide shrub. Now you can prune it back if you don't want it to get um, that wide. Um, but uh, you know, if you have the space, give it space, and that way you can get enough capers to make enough to to uh, to pickle and have a few jars of. The flowers are gorgeous too, as you can see in the picture. Um, you know, it's. Uh, uh, yeah, it's a hummingbird. Hummingbirds are quite attracted to them. Butterflies are attracted to them. Bees, of course. Um, so yeah, that is the caper. All right, bananas. <laughs> bananas. Uh, bananas. Uh, so bananas um, are, can be grown here, believe it or not. And um, and and bananas are, are grown in even colder areas than where we live. Um, Bananas are basically like a kind of almost succulent-like plant, um, but they have a big underground tuber. So if the plant freezes back, they come back right away. And um, different different species of musa and different varieties and selections have different hardiness, but um, but you can grow them. They need to be in a sheltered position. Um, afternoon shade's a good idea. Some sun's nice. But really, uh, you want to try to keep them away from wind where they get beat up. Um, a courtyard is a sort of a great place to put a banana if you want to grow a banana. Um, and they are heavy feeders, so during the growing season, not not in the winter, but during the summertime, you're gonna you're gonna want to feed this um, probably once a month. And um, and uh, see, there's numerous species. There, there are a few nurseries in Phoenix who carry bananas. Um, if you look up tropical fruit trees plus Phoenix on Google, you'll find them. Um, and, and they have a lot of these other weirdo uh, tropical fruit trees that we've been talking about. So, um, so yeah, bananas. I don't want to spend too much time on that, but uh, uh, I think this is a picture of the blue ice cream um, variety that actually supposedly tastes like ice cream. Um, oh, it's, wait, it's called blue, blue something ice cream. But anyway, it, uh, supposedly it's delicious. Um, Question. Does a banana plant need to be outside in order for it to fruit? Yeah. Thought so. Yeah, and a little bit of sun because inside you don't have pollinators. So um, so you, you definitely want it. And they, these guys sucker too, by the way, kind of like an agave. So, uh, so you, you want to give them some place to spread out if you can and you'll you're more likely to get fruits if you allow that to happen um but uh oh and there are actually there's possible you could get one to fruit in because uh there no they that's right bananas can fruit without pollination um 
I forgot about that. With bananas, they can produce seedless fruits. And by the way, uh, uh, a lot of bananas have seeds in them, um, especially if there's a second one around. Um, but uh, um, no, no, I'm backing up again. I'm, I'm confusing myself. <laughs> I'm confusing myself. Uh, if you have a second one around, you get seed, and you'll have fertile fruits. If you, um, if you, if, but you do need pollinators. You need something to transfer the pollen. So uh, you, you, you definitely have to have it outside, at least where you can get some bees or something. So anyway, um, you know, I, I've grown bananas a few times in my life. I haven't grown them long enough to fruit, but I have a lot of friends who have, and. It's pretty cool to see a banana fruit um, in person. It's uh, it's a bizarre plant, like a lot of those tropical plants are. Um, blackberries. So um, you know, I there are the blackberries are actually pretty. There's a few varieties that actually can do well here, better than raspberries. Raspberries are tougher here, um, but this related plant, blackberries, um, uh, there are. Mm, there are several varieties that grow here, um, and we'll go into that. It's a it's a sprawling bramble. Um, if you have never seen a blackberry bramble before, it's so uh, they're long, thorny stems. Um, they're self fruitful. Uh, they're very fast growing. They're deciduous, um, and they can take up a lot of space if they're really happy. Um, they need regular water and feeding. Um, and uh, and it, so you, this is something you're going to grow if you really want blackberries, and you have to have some space for them in the shade, and um, and you're going to have to take some care. Um, these are the varieties that I know to grow here: the black satin, Primark Freedom, Freedom Cheyenne, Olele, and Triple Crown. Um, so. Um, just do some homework and you know uh, ask ask around if you know anyone. The, the, my friend Mark Demick grows blackberries and um, and he was the first person I asked about um, you know his his methods and um, he he grows the top two varieties there the black set and the Primark Freedom and and uh, and he's pretty pleased with with both of those varieties. The other three are the kind of old standby varieties that if you, uh, you know, the, if, that have been around a little bit longer, but I think these newer varieties are, are pretty good. Um, there's, there's more technical uh, things we could talk about with blackberries, like on what canes do they fruit on the first year or second year and all that. Um, it's not really that important if you've just grown the plant. Um, but it's something that you'll notice. Um, but different varieties have different habits on um, on which uh, canes that they're going to fruit on, and you'll see that in the descriptions for for uh, fruit trees when you buy them. Um, raspberries a little bit harder to grow here, and also difficult to find. Um, but uh, kind of a lot of the same stuff. They're self pollinating. Um, not quite as big as a blackberry, um, but um, I have not tried to grow raspberry. Well, that's not true. I've I have grown raspberries, but the native ones, which we're going to get into, but um, I have not tried to grow any of the domestic raspberries before in Tucson. But I, I I've known people to grow these here. Um, they just take a little more care um, and are a little less forgiving if you. You, you know, you don't keep up on your care. <laughs> um, Anne and uh, Baba Berry or Baba Red, those are the varieties that do well here that we know of. Um, oops. So uh, now there are several, several native Rubus species. Rubus is a genus of raspberries and blackberries and dewberries. Um, and, and there's many, many species, and they all have fruits. They're all kind of small and tiny, but they're edible. And so um, this is what I, I think we have two species now in our yard um, that, that we're growing. Um, they're very easy to grow in the shade. Um, ours haven't fruited yet um, down at this elevation, but uh, uh, I haven't exactly taken the best care of it either. The, the raspberry, it's been growing and it keeps, keeps on going, but it's sort of 
back behind um, a palette where I have a bunch of plants on, so uh, I haven't really given it a lot of love. Um, but they are easy to grow, and I have grown them in the past and fruited them in the past, um, back in the 90s. And um, that's when I was taking special care of it. So, um, you know, feeding regularly, um, regular water, definitely put it in the shade. Even, even in the mountains, you find these in the shade. You don't find them out in the full sun very often. And they're not, in the avail they're not available in the trade, so I'm kind of teasing you. But eventually, <laughs> eventually we will probably um, offer these. Um, yeah, so we, we should just propagate the plants we have. Um, blueberries seems like a uh, crazy thing to try to grow here, but uh, uh, in recent years they've found a few varieties that don't need a, a lot of chill hours and they actually can do all right here. Um, so the, the trick of this one is you're definitely going to have to amend the soil because this is somewhat of an acid loving plant and we have alkaline soil. So lots of coffee grounds in the, in the ground and, um, when you feed, you want to feed with an acid loving, um, an acid loving, uh, organic fertilizer. Um, and they have them out there. Um, definitely afternoon shade. Um, and, uh, uh don't use heavy nitrogen on a blueberry. Um, so, you know, if you, again, if you're using organics, you're probably going to be fine anyway. But just watch that first number. You don't want that first number to be too high on a blueberry. Um, Jewel, Misty, Sharp Blue, South Moon, and Sunshine Blue are the varieties. And, and by the way, if you don't have enough time to write these down or whatever, this is going to be archived so you can go scroll, you know, scrub back and, and, uh, um, you know, write all these names down if you need, um, or take a quick picture with your phone. Um, technology. Um, so yeah, blueberries. Okay. Um, this is a plant I have not grown. I've seen people growing this and there's a other species of Gruia that I have grown in the past. Um, it's a, there's a vine that, um, people grow. Um, it's been in the trade a long time. Um, it's a mallow, um, so it's in the Malvasi, and a lot of mallows are edible. Um, this one has these, um, these fruits. And uh, so this is going to be a deciduous, um, mostly a shrub. In, in Arizona, this is going to be a shrub. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, um, but I just want you to know that it's out there. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's frost tender, so you're going to put this in a frost-free zone. Older plants... With most tropical plants, the older the plant gets, the more tolerant it can it is of like light frost, you know. And, and because of our frost in in Tucson and Phoenix, um, they're not very long. It's usually like those last few hours before the dawn breaks. Um, the damage that you do get on tropical plants doesn't uh, doesn't all out kill older plants. They can they can tolerate it. Um, so anyway. Uh, sherbet berry. <laughs> Guess what the fruits taste like. Um, all right, citrus. This is what I really wanted to get to. Um, so uh, we live in a place, in, both in Phoenix and in Tucson, um, there were many um, citrus groves. We grew a lot of citrus. And um, over time, those have disappeared. Um, a lot of it's because there's just easier places to grow citrus and also just urbanization. Um, there's a lot of old trees that are from those old orchards. I have a house, I had a house um, that I owned um, in the early 2000s that had a couple of trees from those, it was one of those original trees from one of those old groves. So that was pretty cool. It was long, whatever we grew in the top was long gone. It was all what they call bitter orange or you know, the rootstock which we're going to talk about that. Um, bitter orange is not just um, something to, to um, stick your nose up at. It's a, actually a very cool plant. But um, I, the, the, it was an old, 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 old tree. And, and my neighborhood had, you know, every few houses had some of those old trees. It was pretty cool. But um, citrus like it here. They, the biggest thing is always going to be cold. And some citrus are a little bit more hardy than others. There's some other problems that, but if you're taking really good care of your citrus most of those problems that they experience in agriculture aren't going to happen first you know, 
hundreds or thousands of one type of plant all together. Anytime you do that, you're going to have problems. And that's why um, agriculture has a lot of problems that, that, that the um, average homeowner doesn't have with plants because they, they have all those plants together like that. So it's a weird way to do things, but that's what we do for now. Um, so oranges, we're starting off with the, just a regular old orange, which is, you know, the navel orange of Lencia, uh, the caracara, which is more of a red fleshed one, and the blood orange, um, also red fleshed. Those are oranges, citrus sinensis, and um, they are frost tender. Um, you're going to get some damage in the, the upper 20s or mid 20s, but they come back from it pretty easily. Um, covering them with uh, cloth and in the ways that we talked about yesterday uh, if, if especially if the cloth isn't touching the actual plant if you can build a frame around it and um, and uh, and protect the plant that way some people will put a bulb a light bulb inside of there like a, a high wattage bulb that puts out some heat um, those are ways of protecting your uh, just don't start a fire <laughs> Be careful when you do that. Um, citrus, in general, like um, you know, a, a balanced fertilizer, but they need those micronutrients. So iron and magnesium. Make sure that, that there's a, there's micronutrients out there. And what I usually tell people that are growing fruit trees is get get what they call citrus food. You know, there's um, organic citrus foods out there that um, that are good for most fruit trees um, and uh, b because nobody's going to complain about having a little extra iron um, most I don't know any plants that have an issue with iron like that so uh, most of the time it's that we're not giving plants enough iron so um, so the orange um, and um, the, as, you know we talked about this in the beginning of the class yesterday but uh, make sure you prune off the the stems that come below the scar where the root graft is it's usually pretty low on the tree that is not the the fruit you want that's going to be like more like a sour orange and uh and then the you know the, the plant you're trying to grow whether it's a you know a grapefruit or an orange or a pumelo um you need to uh you know cut those root stocks and and that way the plant is is um giving the energy to the fruit that you're trying to grow rather than giving a bunch of energy to the fruit you don't care about. Uh, grapefruit, uh, we're, we're, organi we're organizing all this by species, by the way. So there are things that you might consider like a regular orange, but it's not really, and we'll get to that. Um, but uh, yeah, citrus, um, it's, uh, citrus was, I mean, I said citrus. Grapefruit uh, is a hybrid um, and pumelo is one of the parents, and I can't remember what the other, maybe an orange, I don't remember, but uh, pumelo is this giant yellow fruit that looks like an, uh, a, a grapefruit on steroids. And it's, a, um, it's got a thick rind in, in the middle, and it's a little more bitter. Um, that's one of the parents of, of this plant. Um, and uh, um, anyway, you know what a grapefruit is. Um, these are about 50, 50, 15 to 20 feet tall, um, and uh, they are, you know, also something that you need to protect from frost, um, even a little more than the oranges. The one thing grapefruits also get, because their leaves are bigger, they, they have a bigger leaf. It usually has a little bit of a hip on it. Um, especially at the top of the canopy, they get sunburn, and actually, this is something you'll see in all citrus. They get this yellow on the top. It's just merely sunburn, and it's mostly cosmetic damage. I mean, it's not going to end the plant's life. It's not going to be a big problem. It's just something that citrus do. We live in an intense place um, with intense sun, and um, and so they can get that little burn at the top. So um, a little bit of afternoon shade, especially for a grapefruit, will will ease that up a little bit. Just make sure you get at least half a day of sun, but uh, um, so that you do get enough fruit. You know, that's always going to be the battle. The more shade, most of the time with most fruits, you're going to get less fruit if it's more shade. So, um, 
So, you know, you can either have a, a really pretty tree with less fruits on it, or you can have a tree with some yellow on it, and uh, you'll have a lot of fruits. I tend to lean towards, you know, punishing my trees a little bit and letting them have a little bit of yellow leaves. It doesn't really hurt them, but it, uh, um, you know, it hurts uh, humans' eyes, I guess. <laughs> they don't like they, they people freak out about yellow leaves man any yellow leaf we get we get texts all the time of people oh there's there's more yellow leaves than there were before well and that's explain well you know plants exchange leaves the older leaves will turn yellow and drop off that's kind of what they do um, you know you don't always have to panic if there's yellow leaves now if the new growth is yellow and has like green veins um, that's iron deficiency they call it iron chlorosis um, then you're going to have to feed some iron. Um, there's other micronutrient deficiencies that look similar too, but um, again, feed with a, a nice, you know, fertilizer that has a, a, f a few different uh, micronutrients in it, and you'll avoid those problems. Um, yeah, Rio Red and Oro Blanco are the ones you see the most in grapefruits. There's a, there's a few others um, with citrus. Most citrus do really well here. We don't have to worry about chill hours or anything like that. They, they don't mind the heat. So you can grow just about any citrus. And um, most citrus, I don't know of any citrus that really have a huge issue with our heat. Um, someone may, be, may correct me on that. Uh, there might be some weirdos out there that I don't know of. But I've grown... We grow the weirdos, you know, <laughs> that's all I grow is the weirdos and, uh, and they're fine. So, um, so, you know, in general, like you, when it comes to varieties, it's all about what you want, like what kind of flavor you want out of it. Um, you know, that sort of thing. You, you don't have to pick varieties because of chill hours. Um, on citrus, and I may have mentioned this yesterday, but uh, you might get those bird poop looking caterpillars. That is the um, giant swallowtail butterfly. That's the larva of that butterfly. It does not kill the tree. It some sometimes you get a lot of them, and you'll you'll have like you know your tree will look kind of twiggy. Um, the tree will grow back and look actually better than it did before. Um, these plants, as we always talk about at Speedfoot, um, plants have evolved with herbivory, and not only have learned to tolerate it, but sometimes even depend on it. So don't freak out. You're going to get some uh, caterpillars on the tree. You're going to also get those beautiful giant yellow and black butterflies. Um, so there's nothing wrong with it. It's not going to ruin your fruit crop. Um, it, they, they, it happens. It does seem like they like younger trees better than older trees and trees that are more shaded. Um, I guess the leaves might be softer is what I'm going to guess. Um, I've noticed the trees that are a little more shaded tend to get more of those, um, those, uh, butterfly larvae. But again, I like that. I want that on my tree. So, um, so don't worry is what I'm telling you. Uh, kumquats are hardy, uh, for Tucson and definitely for Phoenix. Um, they, uh, they can take some cold. So some of them can go down into the teens. So, uh, that's cool, right? Um, so, um, you know, this is that little citrus that you can eat the peel on, or a lot of people do eat the peel on. It's got a very thin peel and it's, uh, um, you know what a, you know what a kumquat is, I, I, I imagine. Um, they can get pretty big, up to 25 feet tall. Um, this is a really nice plant to have, and, uh, especially if you eat them. Um, and of course you can make, um, out of all of these citrus, you can make, different marmalades out of. Um, and marmalade is you just cooking the citrus with the rind. Um, you know, you cut it up and you add some, but you, most of the time you don't even need to add pectin because there's a lot of pectin in the fruit. And then you can it. Uh, oh yeah, you add sweetener. Um, and, uh, and it lasts forever. So one of the things that you can do with citrus um, to preserve it is to learn how to make marmalade. Just look it up. And I don't want to give that away. No, we'll talk about bitter melon. I mean, bitter, uh, bitter orange. But um, anyway, uh, these are the main, May, uh, Mewa and Nagami are the ones that I've grown. Um, but there's also Marumi and Fukushu. Actually, I've grown those too. Um, and, uh, you know, again, it's about, you know, what you want. Do you want seedless or mostly seedless? Do you want a certain flavor? That's what you're picking when you're picking um, your varieties of kumquat. 
Lemons are very, very fast growing trees. Um, they are definitely um, a little more frost tender, but there's definitely varieties that are more frost tender than others. Um, the picture in there is the um, Ponderosa lemon, and um, that's uh, it's a hybrid between citron and pomelo. I'm sorry, no, that's the pink variegated in the picture, sorry. Um, the Ponderosa is a giant lemon, um, so they mixed in pomelo, which is the same parent as we were talking about for grapefruits. Um, so they got a giant lemon. That picture is a, a variegated, uh, a variegated Eureka. And, um, that's kind of a cool plant. It's, it's got, it, the picture is kind of misleading here because the fruit's actually a little more pink than that. Um, but, uh, anyway, that's a, and then you do see this. I've seen it at places like Mesquite Valley, um, and, uh, Rito Nursery may have had it. Um, and we'll probably eventually have this stuff too. Not probably, we will eventually have this uh, yeah. citrus, um, all the weird ones. Um, but um, anyway, uh, lemons are uh, definitely, you got to worry about the frost with lemons, so protect them. Um, all the same stuff with citrus. Afternoon shade gives them a little bit of a break. Um, and yeah, so that's the lemon. Um, limes. Now, I, I'm tricking you here because I have a picture of a muckrut, um, which is a different species of lime. It's not really a lime, it's a, it's a different species. But I, I know you know what a lime looks like. Everyone, especially if you live in Tucson, geez, if you, uh -huh. don't, if you don't know what a Mexican lime is, like where, where do you even, do you leave your house? <laughs> <laughs> we live with limes in this town. Um, but limes are great, they're fast growing plants, they're frost tender. Um, and some of them are more frost tender than others. But uh, in this, I wanted to talk about the other weirdo limes. So this is muckrut. And, um, and this one is the one you use a leaf on more than you use a fruit. The, um, it's known by a more uh, popular name. I'm only going to say it once because I just want you to know what I'm talking about. But they call it kaffir lime. But don't say that word. It's a, it's a, it's a slur. It's a, it's the N word in, in Africa. And so and unfortunately, um, there's a few plants that they use that name on. So just don't call it that. Uh, Mukra is what they call it in Asia. And I think that's the Thai name for it. So, um, so that's what I call it. And, uh, the fruits are amazing. They have this amazing aroma. I've made, um, marmalade out of those fruits and, uh, and I've also made, uh, other types of um, Korean recipes where they use them as tea and uh, or uh, as tea with a little whiskey um, and uh, it'll bring you back from the dead um, but yeah on the on the muckrat you use the leaves in the f cuisine um, so you if you've ever had Thai food and you've ever had tom kagai that's the green leaf that's in the food um, anytime you've had any kind of Thai dish it has a super citrusy smell and it's not lemongrass it's probably this plant. Um, there's also the Australian finger lime, which is this little weird little fruit, which I showed a picture of in the beginning of the class yesterday, at the very beginning. Um, and the fruit's very different because it opens up almost like a pomegranate, like the, the individual sacs that you see in a citrus, they all kind of separate easily in a finger lime. Um, just that it's just a cool plant. Um, and I think it is actually from Australia. Uh, it's not really from Australia, but um, that one is. Um, Mexican lime is the most one of the most popular limes around here. Um, bear's lime is that's misspelled in there. Uh, it's B like a bear, B E A R S lime. But um, that's an, another common one that you see here. Um, so uh, oh, and the lime quat. So if you want a hardy lime. Get a lime quat. Lime quat is a a lime quat is a hybrid between a lime and a kumquat. So what you get is a is a is a little lime, but it's very hardy uh, to the cold. So if you want a cold hardy lime, grow a lime quat. They're delicious for cocktails um, and all the other things that you're going to use limes for. Uh, so yeah, mandarins and tangelos are not oranges. They're they're different species and um, and uh, you know, but pretty much the same thing. You know, it's a it's a 15 foot tree, um, 
and uh, the you will get so you, they, these are all all these citrus are self pollinating. Um, but if you wanted to get more fruit on these, especially if you plant a second one, you will get more fruit. The drawback to that is you will also get more seeds because a pollinated plant is going to produce more seeds. So uh, you got to decide what you want on that and how you're, how you're using the citrus will determine that. Uh, but tangelos, you know, the, the Mineola tangelo is pretty popular. Clementine is, is one of the, probably the most popular one that's planted in Tucson. Um, there's these other varieties here too, but, um, you know, we're going to run through these citrus. Oh, this is a cool one. And we grow this one. Um, this is a citron, but this is the Budahan citron. Uh, a regular citron looks like a giant oval. So imagine, well, it's really hard to imagine what that fruit used to look like. But, uh, um, you know, if it was all those fingers kind of came together to a point and they weren't as segmented, you'd have a citron. Um, the citron has a long, long history in Judaism um, in terms of use. There's like there's religious ceremonies that they use with citron. Um, and in, of course, in Buddha in Buddhism, um, they use it as well. Um, it's a frost tender plant, more frost tender than than um, than a lot of other things. Um, our poor thing has never been covered. This year I'm covering it. Um, it gets hammered down every year and it slowly grows back, but a little less every year. So this year I'm going to cover it and and baby that thing back. Um, you can make uh, preserves out of it, and I have made preserves out of this. I also made a a dried citrus candy where you you candy it. Um, and uh, you're cooking it, but adding a little bit of sugar um, and then drying it out, and, it, and you make a candy out of it. Um, all these recipes you can find on um, the old Google. But uh, I'm honestly just grow this plant because it, it's cool. Because um, look at that. That's a citrus. Oh, what a freak. <laughs> There's no pulp in it. There's like. Yeah, very maybe little. At the very these things, yeah, it's all rind, all all white um, endocarp pith. pith, yeah, all white pith inside, um, and then sometimes there's a little bit of uh, a tiny bit of uh, fruit in there. So um, this is good connection. Okay, whatever. Huh. Um, okay, and bitter orange. I wanted to talk about this because people have this. Uh, People think that bitter oranges, they call them ornamental oranges, that they, that they don't have a use. Um, the, the thing is, is people just forgot what they are. Um, the Spanish Seville orange here, and uh, they didn't bring tangelos and stuff like that. They brought the bitter orange because uh, they, they knew how to use it. They made liqueur out of it, and they made marmalade out of it. Um, so they, it wasn't a, a fresh-eating orange, although... I don't mind eating these actually. Um, you know, I don't like everything sweet. I'm a bitter kind of guy, so um, I actually like bitter fruits, and I don't mind nibbling on these. But uh, but their their uses are are wide, and they use them they use them as perfumes. They use them in, uh, for a number of things. Um, almost every liqueur that you use to mix in cocktails, almost every single one of them has this species in it. Um, all those aperitifs and digestifs from from Europe, um, all the stuff that that we mix in. Uh, I'm trying to think of a different. There's what, what is the um, thing you put in your margarita? The orange stuff. Triple sec. Yeah, triple sec comes from this, um, and uh, there now there are there are specific varieties of the orange that they grow for um, for certain purposes, but uh, it's basically this plant, and um, and everywhere this plant's gone, they've found a use like that. Would uh, citron be good for li liquor? Yes. Oh, yeah, totally. Uh, citron, now the regular citron has a little more pulp in it than, <laughs> than the Buddha hand, obviously, too. <laughs> I should have put a picture of the regular one in there, the, the citron. But it's kind of hard to get. It's, it's, it's kind of odd that the Buddha hand is the... I mean, I think it's because it's such a novelty. The Buddha hand is a lot more available than the other, um, uh, the other varieties. Um, but uh, uh, anyway, uh, and th here's just to give you an idea. This isn't even scratching the surface. There are a lot of citrus out there, and I think this is actually missing some important family members. 
Um, but um, there is a wide variety of citrus, and there's new ones all the time. Um, the Japanese in particular, of course, um, are, are very fond of making new varieties of citrus, and so they're always putting new stuff out. Um, but uh, it's all about if you can get your hands on it. And uh, so if you're, if you're really into doing that and you're really into finding like some cool citrus, uh, get used to going to California and then hitting some of those nurseries up. Um, and then you're going to have to um, sneak it across the border because you're not really supposed to bring citrus into uh, Arizona. Um, I, didn't, I, I didn't tell you to break the law right now. Um, but... Um, yeah, there there are a lot of really cool citrus, and you start reading, you start looking into this a little bit more, and and seeing the history behind a lot of them. It, it's pretty interesting. You should look into it. Um, by the way, I didn't talk about this yet, but all citrus have beautiful aroma um, from the flowers, like wonderful aroma. And y you're not allergic to it. Um, <laughs> it's another one of those things people think they're allergic to. Um, if you see or smell it. And it's 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 very yellow or very red or very fragrant. fragrant. It's not. It doesn't have pollen that that flies in the air. If pollen that flies in the air has no scent, and comes from flowers that you don't notice because flowers that are air pollinated don't waste energy on petals because petals get in the way of the wind. So um, they don't also waste energy on, a, on scent because they're not trying to attract. Um, um, it, the wind doesn't care what you smell like. Um, the person downwind from you might, but um, anyway, uh, it's it's a it, it just happens to bloom when everything else is blooming. When the grasses really start to bloom, the, the first grasses in the spring, and also um, the uh, ragweeds are blooming during that time of year too. So like the that's what's really getting people. And I, I made this mistake myself when I was younger, and I knew better. I was I was taught about pollen and pollination and all that, and I still I was suffering. I saw the thing, or I smelled the thing, and I said, that's what's making me miserable. Just, you know, I say this all the time, sorry. Uh, date palms. Um, so you may have one in your yard. Uh, if you have some money, <laughs> some money, you can you can start your own date uh, date, uh, palm. And, but you know, they take a long time to grow from a small one. So don't even think about it. Um, and they're kind of expensive to get hold of. You also have to pollinate them. Um, you have to bring pollen to them. If you have a, um, if you have a plant, you, you can buy pollen from, uh, oh gosh. Um, uh, if, if you look up, uh, date palm pollen, um, on Google, uh, you will find in, in Ar at Arizona in there, you will find places that sell pollen because people don't all, they buy them to pollinate their own palms, but they also buy them, uh, because people use pollen for reasons. I don't know, like a health food, I guess. Um, these are palms. Palms don't want their roots mulched. Did you hear that? That's uh, something that's like a, uh, an exception to a lot of the rules that we've been talking about. Um, Palms uh, want to dry out in between waterings. That's why you see these in parking lots, and they're fine. How do they grow in, in like nothing? It's just they're they're very tough. Um, they're monocots, and they just grow differently than a lot of other plants do. Um, now that said, you still should feed and water this plant, and you know, and and the the better you feed it, the more you're going to get good fruits out of it. Palms, in particular in particular really want magnesium. Um, if you see some funky new growth coming out of the middle and it's all crappy looking, that's a, that's a magnesium deficiency. Um, so just feed citrus food. That'll be fine. Um, but yeah, don't mulch the boots. Don't mulch the boots. Yeah, the <laughs> boots work. Uh, don't mulch the poor palms boots. Um, and uh, speaking of clothing, Leave the skirts on your palms if you can. Um, so the skirt of a palm is the old fronds that bend over and they're brown and they create that shaggy skirt. Um, and uh, it's an aesthetic thing for human beings to trim those up, I guess. Um, but if you don't trim them up, you get 
bats, and you actually get some pretty rare bats. And I forget the I can forget the species of bat, but there's a fruit eating bat I think um, that resides in those skirts. And what's amazing about that is that the same bat is rare everywhere else, but in Tucson and Phoenix, um, it's actually for, fairly common because it's just just enough un trees in the, in the town, you know, um, where they don't trim their trees. Uh, and they live in those skirts. Um, and it's not the only thing that lives in those skirts, too. Um, all kinds of... And, and you may think that's a terrible thing, but wasps are pollinators. And um, and they're up there. So, like, let them be up there where they're not going to build a nest, like, where it's going to freak you out. Wasps are mostly really nice anyway. It's really hard to get stung by a wasp. You have to, like, really bother it. Anyway. Um, oh, and most wasps don't sting. Um... So, what did it say? Oh, yeah. By the way, the fresh date palm uh, uh, pollen is uh, February through April is when it's available. And then you're going to have to hand pollinate it. So, um, it, it, yeah, that, I, I talked about buying pollen, but I didn't talk about when. So, uh, anyway, I don't know how many people have date palms, but I thought I'd talk about them. Uh, this is a, there's two species actually, uh, the, the Budia odorata has the better tasting fruit, but Budia capitata is the more common one. These are the pindo palms, um, and they have fruits and, uh, they're fairly hardy. Um, you, you know, there's actually, and they're, they're actually fairly low water too, um, Palms are always thought of as tropical, and I guess we always think about Florida or California when we think of palms, but I don't anymore. I think about um, when I saw them in Sonora, and I saw them in Habitat, and it changed my mind about palms. I really love palms, actually, now. Um, so I like to talk about them. Um, the, these palms are very hardy for Tucson and Phoenix. You don't have to worry. Um, they can take full sun. A little bit of afternoon break isn't bad. Um, leave the skirts for the bats on this one too. These don't get as big. Budia capitata is a, is a, um, you know, maybe. I mean, most of the ones that I've seen in town are like eight feet tall. So um, they can get taller. They can get up to 12 feet. But um, they're self fruiting. I mean, self pollinating too. So you don't have to worry about uh, having another one around. There's a bunch of these on campus. It's a it's a plant that people used to plant more often. Um, so, so you might have an old one in your yard. Um, and of course we have several other landscape and native palms. Um, they're all, they all have edible fruit um, and they all can be made into preserves. I'm telling you this, why? I don't know, we might have uh, Armageddon coming here soon. So you might need to know things like this. Um, these, uh, both these pictures I think are uh, the one on the right looks like a uh, sabal. I should have written down what these were, huh? Um, the other one's a Washingtonia. Uh, Washingtonia is the fan palm. Uh, there's several palms that are native to Sonora that almost make it into Arizona. And maybe um, some thousand years ago they were in Arizona, um, but they're not here anymore. And, well, here. And there are several in town. There's a lot of sabal, Arizona. There's a lot of Brahia armada, which is the blue um, fan palm that's fairly common. The, there's two blue ones. There's the, the Sabal or Asana, which I don't know the common name to, but it's it's a blue fan palm too, but the, the palm kind of curves back, um, and that's how you tell the difference. The Brahia um, Mexican fan palm has blue palm. Um, um, so Sabal has that curving back, and Sabal is actually the cooler plant in my opinion. Um, it's really hard to find in the trade, but back in the day someone was growing a bunch of palms. Talk about fruit trees. Um, you can go to uh, Mission Garden and volunteer. Um, they have a lot of uh, um, opportunities to get your hands in the dirt, and they're always looking for volunteers. and. Um, they got a, a giant garden with a, not the tropical stuff that I talked about today, but most of the plants that I talked about, they have uh, some representation in there. The I used to be on the board, and I'm, it's Mission Garden's pretty close to my heart. They they don't just have a garden. It's just not it's not just a garden. It's 
a garden that represents the plants, even consequence. You've got apples and peaches and and uh, various citrus, mostly pomegranates, pomegranates fi lots of figs, um, loquats, There's which uh, represents um, the Asian contribution. You know, when the Chinese came here, they 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 brought some food with them, and uh, and a lot of people say that they um, influenced uh, Mexican cuisine here too, or our Mexican cuisine, our our regional cuisine here. They say the chimichanga is basically a fried uh, egg roll. I mean, yeah, that's a Mexican egg roll. Yeah. So, uh, um, and and what what we forget um, is that. The Chinese grew all our food back in the day. And you know what? They still do. Um, <laughs> there's many farms uh, out in, uh, in uh, Marana that are uh, still Chinese owned. So, um, so there still are farmers. But after the railroad, they came.